Hello, everyone, and welcome back. This is the final session of our four-part webinar series, Fundamentals of Connection Design, presented by Brad Davis. Today is November 13, 2019. This is Nate Goner with AISC, your moderator for today's webinar. I would like to welcome back our speaker, Dr. Brad Davis. Dr. Davis is an Associate Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Kentucky, where he is responsible for all steel design coursework and re has received excellence in teaching awards. He re received his PhD from Virginia Tech. He has eight years of experience in building design, and as the owner of Davis Structural Engineering, he provides consulting services for structural vibration, steel connections, and advanced steel design applications. He is licensed in approximately a dozen states. He, is a, he has published approximately two dozen journal and conference papers on vibration and has presented a number of continuing education courses for vibrations and steel connections. Brad, welcome back. And now, now turn things over to you. Okay, thanks, Nate. And thank you all for attending this afternoon. Okay, you can see from our schedule that this is the last of our uh, webinars, Shear Connections Part 2. Okay, our topics, to, topic to, topics today will be uh, single angle connections, single plate shear connections, also known as shear tap connections, unstiffened seated connections, and stiffened seated connections. take a quick peek back at our connection classification curve that we saw in sessions one and three. Um, we, need, we need some way to classify beam to column connection as in regard to its um, restraint at the end. And this is our way we do it in, a, in the AISC manual. We're down here at the bottom right uh, for today, just, like, just like, like last time. And these connections that we're going to look at will we'll inevitably have some end moment, but it will be small enough that we can then design the connection and the member as if it's a, as if it's a pinned connection. And we accomplish that through ensuring that we have adequate ductility of the connection. Okay, so let's start off with single angle connections. These are very popular connections, and they're similar to, to the double angle connections we covered last time, except for we do not have a, a we, we do not have an angle on the other side of the beam. In this picture, you can see a, a channel that has a single angle connection. It's welded to the support girder, and then it's bolted to the beam. And these are pretty cool c connections, and they're uh, used quite a lot nowadays. The advantages of these connections are, first off, they eliminate the double-sided erection problem that we discussed last time for double angle connections because, because we, we do not have the shared bolts issue. Second, we have fewer parts than for a double angle connection. The disadvantages are that because we only have one angle and, and also bolts in single shear, we may need a larger angle or larger bolts or welds. Another disadvantage is these can't really resist any meaningful axial loads in the beam due to just the one-sided geometry that we have. Also, just a comment, these are generally not recommended if for laterally unbraced beams like we may have in an industrial application. Starting off with, with the, very, the very basics in the manual, uh, we have guidance for these kinds of connections around, starting around page 10-116. And the very first thing would be to, to, to talk about the, the recommended minimal, minimum angle thicknesses. And the minimum angle thickness is a function of, a function of the bolt diameter. So for 3 quarter inch or 7 eighths inch bolts, the minimum recommended angle is 3 eighths of an inch thick. For 1 inch bolts, the minimum is 1 half inch thick. With that, let's um, zoom in on bolted single angle connections. On the outstanding leg, we're going to need to, to consider some eccentricities. We have one eccentricity that we use for the angle design, E sub A, and a second eccentricity that we use for the bolt design, E sub B. Now, for a single column of bolts, as shown here, 
they're the same. Uh, the, ex the eccentricities are just the same. For a double column, that's not so, however. For the bolts, we need to consider the eccentricity from the reaction or the shear in the beam, which is at the center line of the beam web, over to the centroid of the bolt group. That's for the bolt design. For the angle design, we consider the eccentricity from the, from the center of the web over to the first line of bolts, and that's because the bending moment in the angle would start off at some value here and increase linearly until you, you get to this bolt, and then it will, it will start dropping off again going back this way. So the maximum bending moment in the angle would be along this line right here. Of course, in a single column bolts, it's just right there. So we have these two eccentricities that we need to, need to be using. Just some notes. On the beam side, the eccentricity there is ignored, assuming that we have one column of bolts and the eccentricity does not exceed three inches. This is a similar, similar recommendation as for double angle connections. The holes on the beam side, we can use standard holes or short slots, whichever one we want. On the support side, we need to use standard holes there because we can't have the the angle sort of rotating a little to bring those into bearing and letting the end of the beam twist a little. So we, we want standard holes on the support side. Typically, this, the single angle should be connected to the supporting member in the shop. That will make it easier to erect the beam. The beam just comes in and bolts to the, the leg parallel to the beam web. We have some additional limit states compared to what we've seen in the last few weeks. First, we have angle flexural yielding and we have angle flexural rupture on that outstanding leg. We also have bolt eccentric shear and bearing and tear out on that outstanding leg as well. So we, need, we need to look at those and see how we're, going to, how we're going to check those. All right, so for angle flexural yielding at the outstanding leg, our criterion, because this is flexure, is that, that the required moment must be less than the design strength, the flexural design strength, phi om n. The required moment for LRFD design, M sub U, is V sub U times the eccentricity for the angle, E sub A. And so so you, you can see here V sub U, and there's E sub A. And for the double column of bolts, it's, a, it's the same way, just as we showed before, V sub U there and E sub A there. So now we have our required moment. The flexural design strength in, in this uh, limit state we take as the yield moment. It's phi times F sub Y times the gross uh, elastic section modulus and it's going to be T sub A, which is the, the thickness of the angle, times the length of the angle squared divided by 6. So this is, this is our angle flexural yielding check at, a, at the outstanding leg. Flexural rupture check, similar idea. Uh, we have the same criterion, same required moment, but the flexural design strength is different. Here we're checking rupture through the holes, like along this section here, and along this section right here. We're checking rupture through there. So the, the, the design strength is phi times F sub U times the net plastic section modulus Z net. Phi is 0.75. A Z net we can calculate, it's just through this section right here. Or, or typically we can use a pretty snazzy design aid in the manual, table 15-3. 15-3 looks like this. We have Obviously, this is made with bracket plates in mind, but the, the plastic section modulus that's in this table is along this line right here. That geometry is the same as our situation. This table is set up for a spacing of three inches, which is probably what we're going to have. It has a vertical edge distance at the top and the bottom of one and a half inches. There's a pretty good chance that's what we're going to have, too. And the table is set up for three-quarter inch, seven-eighths, or one-inch bolts. You can see there, three-quarter there, seven-eighths there, and one inch is off the right side of the table or on the facing page. You basically just, just go in here and get your right number of bolts, your, your plate thickness there, and pull your Z-net from here. Only one more comment. The effective hole diameter is already taken into account in this table, so it's, uh, it's very, very convenient. So we're hopefully going to be able to use that. If, if, if our geometry is outside the bounds of this table, we can always calculate Z uh, on our own. We need to check the eccentric shear transfer at the outstanding leg, and we have guidance for how to do this 
in the manual on page 10-118. And also there's a, a lot of helpful information in, in this design example shown here. The recommendation is to use the instantaneous center of, of rotation method. And the only trick here would be what do you use for the design strength of one bolt? And the recommendation is to use the effective fastener strength at the outermost bolt, which is the worst case bolt. Now it's not just the uh, bolt shear rupture strength, but it's, it's the minimum of the bolt shear rupture or bearing tear out of the two, two connected parts. Now one thing, if you, some of you guys may have an older set of these handouts, and I have table 17-1 written here, that is not correct. You can see it's, it's deleted in this final version. The coefficient C, we can get it in general from table 7-6 or 7 and so on. But there, there's a snazzier, faster version in uh, table 10-11 that brings, the, one, brings the, the coefficients we would use most often into one spot just for speed. Moving to welded outstanding legs. In this case, the welds are shaped like an L. We have an L. We have a weld along the vertical, on on the toe here, and, and and along the bottom of the angle. We only have a small return up here. We don't have any other weld along this top of the angle. Now, the reason for that is to provide for the rotational ductility. As the beam in rotates a little bit, we want the, the angle outstanding leg to be, to be able to flex a little and let the top of the angle move away from the support just some very small distance that will be enough to relieve the moment that's trying to develop there. So we have, so we have this L-shaped weld like so. Now we can um, evaluate this using the manual table 10-12 which is very fast and convenient assuming we have the typical geometry that we're going to be using most of the time or we can go to table 8-10. So you can see these here. You can see table 10-12, it's, it's, it's already set up for the typical size, uh, the three inches there, and they're in the right shape. So we can just pull the weld strength from here. Or if our geometry is, is a little different, we'll go to table 8-10, and this is used the same way as we've seen a couple times before in here. So you pull the C coefficient from there, and, you, and then you calculate the nominal strength of the weld group. And these use the instantaneous center of, of rotation method. That's our ultimate strength method that we prefer. All right, with that, that's pr pretty much all to say about um, uh, single angle connections. They're fairly easy. Just a couple of new limb states that are pretty straightforward. Now let's move to single plate shear connections, such as the one here in, in, in which we have a plate that is shop welded to the support with a fillet weld on both sides. And then the beam comes in and, and is bolted to this plate. So these, these are very, very popular connections and they're, they're, they're very nice. We have this um, conventional configuration you see there and sometimes these come extended like here. You know, we, we may, be, because we have a plate not an angle, we can make this dimension uh, pretty much whatever we want w within reason so we can pull this bolt, these bolts out far enough to avoid coping the top flange of the beam. The advantages of the single plate shear connection is number one, they're simple, there are a few parts. There's no welding required on the beam. These can be designed to resist a combination of shear and axial force in the beam. Disadvantages. First, they're stiffer than, than most other kinds of shear connections. It's, it's more difficult to show that we have adequate rotational ductility. We can do it, though. They require careful design. As we'll, we'll see, the design procedure is quite a bit more complicated for these. And finally, uh, these have low to moderate strength compared to the other ty types of shear connections. Uh, often you'll have, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll have these as the default type of shear connection on a job. And then you'll have a handful that just have a bit higher reaction and, you, and then you can't, can't get these to work and you go to some other kind of connection like a double angle or a T perhaps, depending on the situation. These come in two, two basic varieties. We have conventional single plate shear connections and extended single plate shear connections. With the, the conventional ones, they look about like this. We have a small, small dimension A and one column of bolts. So we have some geometric limitations on these. And because of those geometric li limitations, 
we, we can have a simplified design procedure. And, and we're going to avoid checking some of the more time-consuming limb estates because of this. The extended single plate connections maybe look like this, where, where, where we have one column of bolts and it's pulled out farther to, in this case, clear the column flanges to make the connection easier. Or over here, we have a sort of a normal A dimension, but we just need more strength, so we have two columns of bolts. With these, there are very few limitations. So because of that, this A can be pretty big, say, and we have just a, more, a much more general design procedure with several more limit states that we need, need to evaluate to make sure they are, they are okay. The limit states in general, we have the various beam side limit states like the shear transfer, bearing and tear out, coped beam flexure, all, all those that we talked about last time. We have eccentric bolt shear rupture, we have shear transfer, and once we get into the plate we have shear yielding, shear rupture, and block shear. Those are our three basics that we've seen many times by now. Then we have flexural rupture, which is about the same as for the angles we just looked at. We have plate buckling, that's new, and then we have combined shear and flexure, that's new also. When I say new, I mean it's new, new to us in this webinar series. We have, have not seen those before. Let's move to the, the conventional single plate connections. The configuration is like shown. This is the basic connection that you're going to see uh, more often than not. The limitations are, number one, we have one column of bolts. Second, we're going to have the number of bolts is ranges from 2 to 12. So, so these, these are not very onerous limitations, obviously. That's probably what we're going to have anyway. Number three, the A dimension can't exceed 3.5 inches. Typically, that's about 2.5, so that one's no big deal either. The vertical edge distance, like up here and down here, just has to satisfy the limits from table J3.4, so that's pretty easy as well. Next, the weld size, W, needs to be at least 5 eighths inch, or 5 eighths times the plate thickness on, bo on both sides of the plate. The purpose of that is to develop the plate. That way we can, we can avoid actually checking the, checking the weld explicitly. We also have a, a, a requirement that the, the plate or the web can't exceed the maximum thickness from table 10-9 that we'll see shortly. Lastly, we have that the horizontal edge distance needs to be a little bigger than normal. So this horizontal edge distance needs to be at least two times the bolt diameter for the plate or the beam. So none, none of these limits are really going to be a big deal for us. How do we accomplish ductility? Well, these, those last two, last two points back here have to do with satisfying ductility. So let's see what we're trying to do here. The idea for, for providing ductility here is to make the plate or the web thin enough that the bolts will have some significant bearing deformation you know, in the thinner material. And we call this plowing. We say the bolts need, need to be able to plow into the plate, like in, in this picture. So the, the, the beam rotates a little bit clockwise in this picture. The top bolt's plowing into this plate and deforming it, sort of a, you know, high bearing deformation. And down here is plowing the other direction. So we need to be able to make the, the plate or the web thin enough so that this can happen. And that's how we're going to achieve ductility. This is obviously a ductal type of uh, deformation. And this is how we're going to achieve ductility for this type of connection, for the, the conventional single plate connection. Limit states. First, we have to check the bolts and the plate for ex eccentric shear. And the, the eccentricity is given in table 10-9. And you can see it's, it's very often A divided by 2. Sometimes it's A. Now, almost always I've seen short slots in these kinds of connections. I shouldn't say almost always. A lot of times we have those. And for those, you can see it's always A divided by 2 for, for both of those. So our eccentricity is usually going to be half the A dimension. There's not a lot new here, so let's go ahead and, go ahead and just jump into an example. 
In this case, we want to determine the required number of bolts and the plate and weld sizes for this connection. You can see we have a W14 by 30 beam. The required shear is 40 kips. We have 3 quarter inch diameter grade A325N bolts, standard holes, A36 plate material, and we have our double sided weld of a size that, that's unknown yet. Now I'm using standard holes in this example because one check we're going to do is a little harder with that and with short slots. We're going to have short slots a lot of times for these kinds of connections. Let's start with bolt shear rupture. I want to first come up with a trial number of bolts. We need that to really get us going. So I'm going to come up with a trial number of bolts based on direct shear, ignoring the eccentricity. So let's say we try three, three quarter inch diameter A325 bolts. We probably have this number memorized by now, the strength of one A325 in bolt in single shear, 17.9 kips, multiplied by three for three bolts. We have 53.7 kips. That exceeds 40 kips. So this is a pretty good place to start. We, it, it exceeds it by a little bit. Once we consider the eccentric shear in a minute, it, it might be pretty close. So let's start with three as, as our trial number of bolts. Now we have, now we can set some trial plate geometry. And this is what I'm going to use. I'm, I'm going to use five inches wide, which gives us, and then I'm going to, I'm going to, put, going to put the column of bolts halfway across the plate. So we have a dimension of two and a half inches. A vertical edge distance of one and a half, two spaces at three inches, and then one and a half there. And the cool thing about this geometry is it doesn't matter which way you flip this, this plate around, it's, it's still going to be oriented the, the correct way. What about our, our limits? Does this qualify for a single plate, uh, a conventional single plate uh, connection? The number of bolts is three, that's between two and 12, so we're good there. The A dimension is two and a half, that's less than three and a half inches, so we're good there. The horizontal edge, di edge distance is two and a half inches. That's more, that, that's larger than two times the bolt diameter, one and a half inches, so this is okay. The vertical edge, edge distance is one and a half inches. That exceeds one inch, which is the minimum from table J3.4, so all of these are okay. So we can use this and proceed with the conventional single plate um, design procedure. Also note here that the height of the connection, the, 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 uh, the length, the, the vertical height is nine inches. That's, that's larger than the T dimension divided by two, or 5.81 inches. So that's okay also. Note this, this is the limit we mentioned last time. It's not a spec limit, but it's very highly recommended in the manual part 10. So this seems like pretty good geometry. Um, we have three bolts, good, good, good looking geometry, so let's, let's proceed with the calculations. What about rotational ductility? We can check that very quickly and use that to set the, the thickness. So for two to five bolts, we're here. And standard holes, we're, we're here. Our maximum plate thickness is the bolt diameter divided by two plus a sixteenth. Note, here's why I chose standard holes for, for this example. We just wouldn't even have to do this if we had short slots. But we have standard holes. So that the maximum thickness is, is going to be seven sixteenths of an inch. So I'm going to try a quarter inch plate. That's less than seven, that's thinner than seven sixteenths, so it's okay for that, for the, rota the rotational ductility. And I'll also note that the web thickness is 0 0.270 inches for our W14. Seems pretty proportional to have the plate similar to this. Okay, so this is our trial, trial plate. While we're here, let's grab the eccentricity E that we're going to use to, to design the bolts. It's going to be eight divided by two or 1.25 inches. So table 10-9 is obviously our go-to resource for this conventional single plate shear connection procedure. Let's check our eccentric bolt shear strength. We have our strength for one bolt from before. And we have our, the number of bolts is three. The eccentricity is, eccentricity is 1.25. So we go to the manual table 7-6 and pull out the C coefficient, 
which we can, we can think of as the effective number of bowls. We've done this before, so I'll just skip the step of showing how to get that. So our strength for, for the connection then is the one bolt times C, the strength of one bolt times C. So plugging those, those numbers in, we have 46.4 kips that exceeds 40 kips, so this limit state is okay. Now in, in the, um, we, we, we also have, have some basic limit states. We have, we have shear yielding and shear rupture. I'll just skip over this pretty quickly because we've done this a couple of times. For shear yielding, you can see we have a fee of one and, and, and we're just checking this on the growth section. And we have 48.6 kips. That exceeds 40 kips, so it's okay. Shear rupture is a little trickier, so maybe we should spend a little, little time on that. We're checking this through this line. And the, the trick here is we need to take out the three bolt holes. And we need to take the effective hole diameter uh, out for each of those. So that's going to be 13 16 which is the size of the standard hole, and add another 16 so we have 7 eighths. 41.6 kips. That exceeds 40 kips, but not by much. But it's okay. Moving on to block shear. Uh, going through our calculations for this failure surface, we have 52.8 kips, and that exceeds 40 kips, so block shear is okay. Now moving to, to shear transfer, this one's a little trickier. So we go in the manual and see what's recommended. In there, in the 15th edition, it says that bearing and tear out should be checked using no, no eccentricity, just using concentric loads and direct shear. So that's how I've chosen to do, to do a shear transfer check here just with straight vertical shear. We need the bolt shear rupture strength and the bearing and tear out strength for the two connected elements, so let's, let's just move right in. So the bearing, or the bolt shear rupture strength, nominal strength is 23.9 kips, that's just your 17.9 divided by 0.75. We can observe here that the beam wheel will not control. It's A992 steel, whereas the plate is A36, and it's a little thicker also, so we can just dismiss the beam web and now look at the plate bearing and tear out strength. Well, the plate, the bearing strength at one of the holes in the plate, of course, that's going to be the same at all the holes, is 26.1 kips. The plate tear out at A is tearing out the bottom of the plate, whereas at B is tearing, the tear out is, is between the holes. So A is different from B in this case. So the plate tear out at A, 19.0 kips. Tear out at B, 38.1 kips equations that we've seen a few times. We go to each hole or each bolt and pick the minimum. So at, at A, the minimum is, or the effective fastener strength is the minimum of the bolt shear rupture or bearing or tear out. So it's the tear out. So there's 19 kips going in there. Going to bolt B, this one is the minimum of, again, bolt shear rupture, bearing, or tear out down here now. So bolt shear control. is 50.1 kips. No, we're ignoring eccentricity for this check. Fillet weld. And here we don't really calculate a strength of the fillet weld. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a weld that's at least 5 eighths of the plate thickness. And what this is going to accomplish is it's going to guarantee that a weld is stronger than the plate. This will fully, de fully develop the plate in combined shear and, and, um, and the tension from, from the flexure. So this is going to develop the plate so that we just, we just uh, worked pretty hard to show that the plate's okay. If the plate's okay against the load, then the fillet, and if the fillet weld is stronger than the plate, then, then of course the fillet weld is stronger. So 5 eighths of our, of our plate thickness is 5 30 seconds, so we need to use a 3 16 inch fillet wheel on both sides, like, like shown there. And again, this will develop the plate. We don't even need to calculate the strength of this weld group. We know it's strong enough. Our final design then looks like this. We, 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 we don't have any, anything else to check. So we have 3 3 quarter inch um, F3125 grade A325 in bolts and standard holes. We have a plate that's a quarter inch thick by, by five horizontally by nine inches vertically, A36. We have three sixteenths welds, 70 KSI welds. That resists this required shear of 40 kips. 
and if shear rupture controlled, and the design strength of the connection is 41.6 kips. All right, so that's conventional single plate connections. So let's move to extended single plate connections, and this gets quite a bit more complicated, obviously, because this is a more general procedure. With these, again, we're we have a couple of things that happen. One is we, we can drag these bolts out farther, so we have this larger piece of plate here that we need to deal with. In this case, we're trying to clear these column, clear the clear the column flanges to make the the connection uh, easier. And I guess if if the beam flange is wide enough, we would have had to cope it if we brought this on in here too. So we we're, we're going to want to bring these out sometimes like like this. Also here, sometimes we have a limited depth. We can't continue putting more bolts vertically, but you need more strength. You can put two columns of bolts in like so. These don't qualify for the the um, conventional single plate design procedure, so we need to use the extended single plate procedure. By the way, the extended single single plate procedure applies to just any shear tab connection, a single plate connection that does, that, that 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 violates any one of the limits for the conventional connections. So, it, so the connection can look like a conventional one, but it doesn't qualify. It, doesn't have, it does not have to be one of these where it's extended out to be an extended single plate connection, although that's usually what happens. Limitations, really not very many. No limit on A. So if you have a plate dimension A that's within reason, uh, you're you're fine. Uh, now, if, obviously, if it's four feet long, it's kind of becoming a beam now, not a connection. But if you have a anything that's sort of normal in the realm of connections, we're good. Next, there's no limit on the number of bolts in a column of bolts. There's no limit on the number of columns of bolts. You can you can have two or three, or whatever. Here we only have to satisfy. Here the the edge distances only have to satisfy the specification table J 3.4. Finally, the maximum plate thickness is such that plate flexural strength, the, the plate flexural strength, does not exceed the bolt sh the bolt group flexural strength, or we can satisfy the conventional plate uh, max thickness requirements. So, what's those? What's this? What's this last couple of lines about? Well, we need to ensure that we have rotational ductility, just like we need to do for every kind of shear connection. And the strategy for the extended single plate connections is to make sure that the ductile limit state of plate flexural uh, yielding, so the plate flexural strength, does not exceed the, the, the less brittle or the less ductile limit state of bolt group uh, rupture. So we want to make sure that the, the, the ductile limit state happens first. The plate flexural strength. Is just the yield. This is the yield moment. Fy times the gross elastic section modulus, and that can't exceed m max is what we call this bolt group flexural strength, and that's F sub n v divided by 0.9 times the area of one bolt times this C primed coefficient. So let's talk about this for a little bit. Okay, F sub n v in table J 3.2 includes a factor of 0.9 in there to account for the non-uniform distribution of the shears in a group of bolts that are end loaded. Well, our connection here is not end loaded, so it doesn't really apply. And that, that point 0.9 factor doesn't really apply. Now, because this is not a strength check, this is a ductility check instead, we have the, the liberty to take that point 0.9 factor out, and then that's what the manuals committee has done. So we take the point 0.9 factor out of FNV. Multiply that by the area of one bolt, and now we have the, the strength of one bolt. Now to get the bolt group flexural strength just in pure moment and, and no applied shear, you multiply this by the C primed coefficient. That's the equivalent eccentricity for pure moment. And we, we get that from the, the same manual tables that we've been using for eccentric, eccentrically loaded bolt groups. So we can take this this uh, bolt or the plate flexural strength and set it equal to M max, and then we can back out the, the maximum thickness of the plate. So what we get is this. We get that the maximum thickness of our plate is 6 M max over Fy times L squared, or more conveniently, this. 6 times the Fnv divided by 0.9 
area of one bolt C primed and then F Y and L squared. So we need to make sure our plate is no thicker than this. And this is going to be pretty easy to satisfy typically. So this is the route we're going to want to go. Alternatively, we can use the plowing rules that we used a minute ago for the conventional connections. That's going to be more difficult to satisfy uh, typically. So we can do that, but we're typically going to do this instead. If you want to see why you can do this, see the exceptions on page 10-90 in the manual. What are our plate limit states? First, we have shear yielding. That's, that's in the growth section just to the left of the bolts or bolt holes. Bolt holes. Shear rupture along this line, section one. Flexural rupture along section one also, and this check is going to be very similar to the check we did for angles uh, earlier today. We have we have an interaction of shear yielding and flexural yielding. And that's, that's new to us. That's just to the left of one also. We have block shear. That's this section two. And then we have plate buckling in this region over here. And that's a new, new limit state for us also. Start with the easy ones. Plate shear yielding, shear rupture, and block shear. That's just the same as we've been doing for, a, uh, for the whole series pretty much, so we'll just skip over those. Plate flexural rupture, that's a little new. It's the same as for our single angles we covered earlier today. Our criterion is this for L or FD. Our M sub U is V sub U times A, and there's the A distance over this first line of bolts. The M sub N is F sub U times Z net through this line again, just like for the angles. And we're probably going to get Z net from table 15-3, or we're definitely going to do that if we can. If we can't, then we, we will just calculate it ourselves. Note one thing here that, that, that you can tell from this M sub U equals V sub U times A. We're, for this design model, we're putting the hinge right here, up against the face of the support. That's why we're using V sub U times A. Now, that's just a design model. There's probably some negative moment there. It's probably drug over this way a little bit for the actual hinge, but in our design model, the hinge is right here. Shear and flexure interaction. Now, this is new. We need to make sure that this inequality is satisfied. So we have uh, the shears in this term and then the moments over here. You can see the squ they're squared, which is very helpful, obviously. And this is similar to the von Mises yield criterion. We do this because the maximum shear and moment can be at, at the same place in the plate. And unlike a W shape or other I shape, you know, consider for a beam, for, for example. Uh, even if we have the maximum shear and moment in the same place, the shear is primarily resisted by the web and the moment is primarily resisted by the flanges. That's not so here because we have this rectangular section. So we're going, we need, need to check this. Only tricks here would be, first, what do you use for phi? This is just shear yielding, so we use a phi for shear of 1 and for bending 0.9. It's a little strange, but that's what we do. We have the required shear phi sub u. The, shear, the, the nominal shear is just for shear yielding again. I guess the only other trick here would be, what do you use for m sub n? And we use the plastic moment Fy times z of the plate. That's the gross z of the plate, not net. So it's just the thickness of the plate times L squared divided by 4. We just need to gather up all these parameters and, and evaluate the inequality. Plate buckling, this is also a new one for us. In this case, we're going to treat, the, we're going to treat this plate region right here like the web of a doubly coped beam like shown below. We're going to be checking using this eccentricity or an unbraced length A. So this is like, so this, this, this location here is like down here at the edge of the cope that we checked last time. Our criterion is going to be uh, just as you see here because this is flexure. We have the required moment can't exceed the design flexural strength. Our M sub U is V sub U times A because, again, we're, we're, our, our design model has the hinge here. And just like we did uh, for coped beams, we're going to use section F11 of the spec with some variable substitutions down here that, that, that we'll talk about. And we're using the CB from the manual part nine 
equation 9-15. Now that CB, there's an equation for that, but the lower bound is 1.84. Now 1.84 is a pretty darn large CB. We'll, we'll, we will keep that in mind. That's, that's very helpful to, to note that. All right, going to these, um, these variables in section F11 of the spec, L sub B is in there, the unbraced length. For us, that's going to be A, this, um, this distance there. There's the depth of the plate in section F11. That's L for us. There's the thickness of the plate in F11, and of course, that's T sub P for us. So we just need to swap these variables out and use section F, section F11. And in F11, this is what we see. We have, just like we talked about last time, we have three regions. We have if the cylindrical parameter does not exceed lambda p, then yielding is the behavior of failure, or would be the behavior of failure. If lambda is between lambda sub p and lambda r, then inelastic buckling is the behavior, and this is our equation. Note we have CB there. And because the CB is so big, there's a pretty good chance this expression will exceed the MP and we'll want to stop and use the MP instead. If lambda exceeds lambda r, we have elastic buckling, and the same deal. We have CB in here, and we can't exceed MP under any circumstances. Using a swapping our swapping our variables in, this is our slenderness parameter, A times L divided by TP squared, and this is our yielding limit, lambda P, and our inelastic buckling limit, lambda sub R. All right, so we'll just uh, use these as shown. Other other limit states. We have the eccentrically loaded bolt group shear strength. We also have shear transfer. We have the fillet weld strength, but here we don't really calculate the strength. Uh, same deal as we used before, we're going to develop the plate. We're going to make sure that the weld size is at least 5 eighths of T sub P, and that will develop the plate. We're going to make sure the plate's okay, so if the weld's stronger than the plate, then of course it's okay also. All right, so let's do an example. In this case, we want to evaluate the extended single plate connection shown if V sub U is 30 kips. We have five 16 inch fillet welds. We have a half inch plate. The beam is, four, is a W14 by 43. The column is a W14 by 90. Now you can see what we're trying to do here. We've pulled this connection out to get past the, to get past the uh, column flanges. The plate's a half inch by nine vertically by one foot three horizontally. We have seven eighths inch grade A325N bolts. And we have two columns of them and six total. So we, we want to evaluate this connection. Let's start with rotational ductility. We need to make sure that our thickness is not, ex is not exceeding this. So we need to gather up these, these variables over here. For 7 8 inch bolts, we have our F sub N V is 54 KSI from table J3.2. That's for uh, grade A325N. The area of one bolt is this. Going to our plate, here's our yield stress and our vertical uh, height of it. Next, we need to C primed, and this is new, so let, let's spend a little, little time on this. So what we're going to do here is go to I'm um, going to go to table 7-7, seven -seven. and that's, that's the one with a 3-inch horizontal spacing. Let's see this. Go to table 7-7, table seven -seven. note we have 3-inch spacing here. We, we make sure it matches this, make sure we're in the right table. We have a vertical spacing of 3 inches, so we go here and find the 3 inches here. So we're again, we're making sure we're in the right table. All we got to do then is go across here to the right number of bolts in the row. We have three, and go straight down to the bottom, and that's C primed. Now note what this, this is a little different from, from the other Cs. The, these, these Cs, these guys are dimensionless. You can think of those as like the effective number of bolts. Here this one has a dimension. It has inches for the units. So 15.8 inches is our C primed. We can, we've gathered up all these variables now. We can calculate the maximum thickness. Putting all these in there, we got the 54 going in, we got the area of the bolt, C primed, 
if y of the plate, height of the plate, 1.18 inches. That's pretty thick, so this is not very difficult to satisfy. Our plate's a half inch thick. That does not exceed 1.18 inches, so that means it's okay. What, what, what we've done here is ensured that the ductile limit state of plate yielding would occur before the less ductile limit state of bolt shear rupture. And by guaranteeing that, we were able to use this as a simple shear connection. Also note, just in passing here, uh, I use the uh, conventional single plate shear connection uh, method as well in table 10-9 with the T-max there. And this connection would barely pass using that for the plowing. So we're going to want to use this most likely rather than the uh, plowing thickness limit. Okay, moving on to some of our, uh, some of our limit, state che limit state checks. So let's go to eccentric bolt shear rupture first. Uh, we need the strength of one bolt, and that's 24.3 kips for our, for our bolts. Then we go to uh, the manual table 7-7, and to get the C value, let's, let's go grab that table 7-7. So we go in here, first off, make sure we're, we have the right, the right table. We have three there, so good. Three there, so, we're, so that's good. We have the number of bolts in the row, or in each column. We have uh, three. We have three uh, rows of bolts. We go to our eccentricity, which is 11 and a half inches. Interpolate between here, and C is 1.30. Bring that back over here, and our strength then is, is just that 1.30 times the strength of one bolt, or 31.6 kips, and that exceeds 30 kips, so it's okay. Not by much, but it, it is okay. Also, I should probably emphasize, I don't, don't think I emphasized this, emphasized this enough, the eccentricity is to the center of the bolt groups. So that, there's where the 11 and a half came from. Next, shear transfer. And in this case, it's not so clear what to do for this. So here's, here's what I think we should do is we should determine which bolt controls, get its effective strength, and just use, use that mul mul multiplied by the C coefficient. This is a very conservative approach, and hopefully there will be some other guidance that, that comes out that will help us know what to do besides this, but this is what I think we, sh we, we should do for now at least. So let's, let's do the shear transfer calculation this way. So first, let's gather up all these strengths. So the bolt shear rupture, the nominal strength, 32.4 kips. Go to the plate, calculate the bearing strength for one of the bolts. Of course, it's the same for every bolt, 60.9 kips. Bolt A tear out is at the bottom. That's going to be 35.9 kips. Bolts B and C are tearing out between the holes, so they have a higher strength than bolt A's tear out. 71.8 kips. Now moving on to the web, for, we have the bearing strength at one of the bolts in the web. Of course, they're all the, the strength the same at, at each of the holes, 41.6 kips. Bolts A and B can tear out between the holes, and for those we have 49.1 kips. We don't really have a tear out strength for C because it's there's it, there's a they, because so we have the flange up here. There's, there's no there's no other hole or, or the edge of the plate up there. Now looking at this, at every single one of these bolts, shoot bolt shear rupture controls. You can see this is smaller than all these numbers. So bolt shear rupture controls, um, and so we, we would take that times the C coefficient, and we just get the same thing we just did a minute ago, and we, and we get 31.6 kips. Now imagine if bolt A would have controlled. Bolt A's tear out is not far from controlling, 35.9 kips versus 32.4. If this would have controlled, then I would have taken that times C instead, and that would be our strength for shear transfer. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen with this check over the next few years, but this is what I think we should do right now. Okay, moving on to shear yielding. This is the basic check through there. We get 97.2 kips. That exceeds 30 kips. Okay. Shear rupture, again, through these holes. So we have three effective holes coming out. 78.3 kips exceeds 30 kips, so that's okay. Block shear, this is pr pretty basic stuff, I guess, I guess at, the, at, the, at this point. The only interesting thing here is first, we have two different patterns. We have the L-shaped pattern there, 
and then we have this dashed pattern here. And both of those applies. We can tell that this L-shaped pattern controls because with the dashed line one, we have this long shear area there as well. So we can tell, for, we, we can tell by looking at it that the L-shaped pattern controls. So we calculate the gross area subject to shear and these other, uh, other two areas, no problem there. The only other interesting thing here, I think, is the UBS factor. Because we have two columns of bolts, we have this long line here on the, on the tension plane. I think that looks like this figure C-J4.2. It's the example that's given in, in that figure when you would use 0.5. So I'm going to use 0.5 for UBS in this case. Plugging all these numbers in here and applying the feed factor, we get 98.8 kips, exceeds 30 kips by a mile, so block shear is okay. Plate buckling, here's, here's our new to us limit state. And our demand, our required moment is this, VCBU times A, VCBU is 30 kips, A is 10, so we have 300 kip inches. Now we gotta move on to calculating M sub N. The cylinder's slender, parameter is A times L over, over the thickness of the plate squared, that's 360. We need to know how that compares to lambda P and, and lambda R so we know what the failure mode would be at, at failure. Lambda sub P, 0 0.08 times E over FY, we get 64.4 for that small number. So lambda exceeds that. So we know yielding is not the applicable behavior. The inelastic buckling limit, Notice this is enormously larger than the, than the yielding limit. So we have one, 1530 for that. This lambda is between the two. It's very, very often like that because this, this inelastic buckling region is so wide between these two. So here we have inelastic buckling. To calculate the strength for that, we need the yield moment and the plastic moment. The yield moment is just, on, is just calculated on the growth section. So we have the thickness of the plate times the vertical dimension squared divided by six. That's the, the equation for the S for a rectangle, obviously. On the growth section, we get 243 for that kip inches. Because this is a rectangle, we know the shape factor is 1.5. So MP, we can calculate just 1.5 times MY or 365 kip inches. Of course, that's true only, it's only 1.5 times MY for a rectangle. Now here's our equation for M sub N. Note we have CB in there. We actually have an equation for CB, but it bottoms out at 1.84. Now I'm looking at this thinking, this expression is probably going to be bigger than MP. So I'm just going to grab the lower end CB value, be conservative on that, and save some time and see what happens. So we plug, this, plug all this stuff in here, and, and we do. We get, six, we get 625 kip inches, which exceeds MP, which is only 365, so we, have, so we must stop and use MP. So phi M in is phi MP, or 329 kip inches. That exceeds M sub U, the required moment. So we're good. This, this limit state is okay. Not by a lot, but it is okay. Now shear and flexure interaction. In this case, we're going to evaluate this inequality down here. So we need to gather up these. So VU is 30, obviously. MU is 300 kip inches like it was a minute ago. Phi VN is for shear yielding. We calculated this earlier, 97.2 kips. Phi MN is just the, the is, is phi times MP. Plugging these numbers in, we get 328 kip inches for that. So we gather these up, put them in the inequality, and we get 0.932 does not exceed one, so the shear and flexure interaction is okay. Finally, moving on to the weld strength. In this case, just like, just like before, we do not calculate the strength of the weld. We just need to, need to have a weld size, W, that's at least as big as 5 eighths times the plate thickness. That's 5 sixteenths of an inch in this case. That's a pretty good size fillet weld. But it can be done in one pass, as we discussed back at the end of, I think, session one. 
just to be sure, let, let's go look at table J2.4 and see what the min is. The min's only 3 16 so that's no problem. So our 5 16 inch wells are adequate, so we can use these. That will develop the plate. We just wore ourselves out showing that, that the plate is strong enough. So if the weld will develop the plate, then the weld will certainly resist the loads. Overall then, the connection is okay for the, the required shear of 30 kips. Okay, let's totally change gears now to welded, unstiffened seated connections. These are connections like you see here where we, where we have a seat angle. And it's in, 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 in our session today, we're going we're to limit ourselves to welded ones like this where they're welded on these two sides. So this is this this angle is welded to the to the column in the shop, and then they bring the beam in, bolt it down, install the top angle, and then that's that's pretty much it. Top angle obviously is for stability to keep the beam from trying to roll. Obviously, you you could also bolt this seat angle to the column, and there's there's methods in the manual for that, but we're going to stick with welded ones for for us here. The advantages of this kind of connection, number one, which I didn't put a bullet point here for, is erection safety. Obviously, we don't have any issue with the double-sided bolts. We just bring the beam in and bolt it down. Next, we have few, few parts, few bolts, and these are convenient at the web of a column. So there's lots of advantages to these. Disadvantages, obviously, we, we need the top angle, which that adds a part, so that's, that's, that's a disadvantage, I guess. Limited strength. And also, these cannot resist any significant axial load in the beam. What are our limit states for this kind of connection uh, that we have here? First, we have beam web local yielding in this region. We have beam web lo local crippling also in that region. We have seat angle bending. You can see this is just cantilevering out there. You can bend the seat angle. Seat angle shear yielding just shearing it off there. And finally, we have the eccentric uh, rupture of the weld. We have this eccentrically loaded weld group. It's loaded out of plane. The, the reaction's over here somewhere, so it's kind of bending this out of plane. So we need, to, we need to evaluate all of these. Most of the heavy lifting is in coming up with the design model for angle flexure. And I'm going to show you what's, what's, what's recommended in the manual. We're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to calculate this L sub B, which is the max required for web local yielding or web local crippling. We're going to calculate this. Notice it doesn't have to go all the way to the end of the angle. We're, we're, we're going to calculate what we need for this, for the beam to be okay. Then we have the setback, obviously, as well. Okay, the first thing is we note here if this, this L sub B that's required plus the setback if that's bigger than the horizontal leg length, then, the, then it's no good. You would need to do something else, like add a stiffener to the beam or something like that. So our, our method we're showing here would be no good in this case. You'd have, to, you'd have to do something else. What do we use for the setback? We have nominally half an inch, but then we have the quarter inch beam length tolerance as well. So for our calculations, we're going to be using three quarters of an inch for the setback. Note one more requirement in section J10.2. The bearing length has to be at least the K dimension of the beam, and we take that as K as K design. Still working on the design model. Our required moment is R sub U times the eccentricity E. Now, the eccentricity E is from the critical section at the edge of the fillet over to the center of this bearing area L sub B. Note we have this, this assumption, and this, this is our, our design model, is that we have this uniform load there, so that way we, we can pin down where R sub U is. It's half of L sub B over from the, end of, from the end of the beam. L sub B, again, is going to be the max of the required bearing length for web local yielding or the required bearing length for web local crippling of the beam. But note it's got to be at least the K design. Our eccentricity we can calculate just from, from arithmetic. We're trying to get this dimension right here. So it's 3 quarters of an inch plus LB over 2. Then you subtract off the sum of TA and this 3 eighths of an inch, which is the typical design assumption. 
So we end up with this for the eccentricity. Now we can calculate M sub U. So we need these required bearing lengths. So to get these, all we do is we, we, we start with our equation for the strength, and this is for web local yielding in this case, phi times FY of the web times CW times this stuff. And we set this equal to R sub U, put LB for web local yielding in for LB, and just, and just use algebra and back out LB for web local yielding, and we get this simple equation. Note we use a K design for the K in here. Also note that there's a, some really nice design aids near the end of part nine of the manual, table 9-4, that can, that can help quite a bit with this process as well. Similarly, for web local, local, local crippling, you start with your web local crippling equation. This is, this is with the reaction at the end of the beam. Set those equal to R sub U and back out the, the required bearing length. Now, of course, here we have two different options. So you've got to assume one and then go with it and, and see what you get. Then maybe you have to jump to the other one. Also note that we also have table 9-4 for these. And these, these equations are pretty ugly looking. So we might want to we might want to go look at table 9-4 for those. Now once we have m sub u, which is just r sub u times e, you know, one, you know we 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 need lb for that. Once we go through all that, we can set m u equal to equal to phi on p, and just back out the th the required thickness of the angle, and it's just this. You, you can see the four there, which is the, which is the dead giveaway that we're using the plastic section modulus. The only, the only new variable here is L sub A, which is the angle length in and out of the figure. We need to check angle shear yielding also, shear yielding on this critical section. And here we, we, we simply use the, uh, shear, the, the shear yielding equation from um, section J4, this is equation J4-3. So this is basic stuff for us. The only trick might be what do you use for the shear area, gross shear area, it's the length of the angle in and out of the figure times the thickness of the angle. Weld rupture strength, what are we gonna do with that? And here we have, see how we, how we have the eccentricity there? Some of you have your older set of slides that were issued before, that was to the wrong place. This is where it should be. It should be from the face of the support over to, the re over to this reaction. All right, so we, use, we have an eccentrically loaded weld group, and the tr traditionally we're using the elastic method. And you, you can see this equation on page 10-72 of the manual. Now you see that this, this equation probably look, looks pretty familiar. It, look, it, it, it looks a lot like the, the uh, strength equation for the bolted welded knife type uh, double angle connection. It's very, very similar. The only difference is that we're, we, are, we are including the end returns in this equation, so this constant is a little bit different. So this is the strength for the weld. Also, we could resort to using, or, or, or we could choose to use, not resort to, this is a fine option, go use the instantaneous center of a rotation method uh, facilitated by manual table 8-4. We could do that instead. You can do either one you want. Now with that, let's move to welded stiffened seated connections. And here's a pretty cool looking one on, in, in this picture. Here we have a, a massive W14 column with some massive cover plates. And you can see the beam is, is coming into the web, and, it, and it's bolting to this stiffened seated connection. It has, it has a seat plate there, and it has a, a seat stiffener here. Of course, this is welded to the column web. We're going to limit ourselves, just for the sake of time, to these welded types like, like this. So we have this, this weld that's shown like so. There's bolted ones also in the manual. And, and, and there's also, in, in the manual, other situations like the beam coming in, you know, coming in and out of the figure here, instead of going left to right. But we're going to limit ourselves to this kind of connection just for the sake of time. The advantages, again, erection, erection safety, these bring the, bring the beam in and bolt it down. You don't have any issues with this double-sided connection. 
like, like with double angles or T's potentially. We have few parts, few bolts. It's convenient for uh, column web connections. Disadvantages, I guess the primary one is that it's going to introduce a column web limit states, but as we're going to see, that's really not a big deal either. So this is a pretty cool connection. I should probably mention the top angle. I didn't mention that earlier. You, you can see we have this top angle up here that, that prevents the beam from rolling. Just provides for the stability of the beam. Limit states will be beam web local yielding or, and crippling. We have strength of the stiffener plate. We have the eccentric shear strength of the weld group. We have column base metal strength and a column web punching shear strength. We're going to approach this with a, with a, with the simplified method that's in the manual. There's a, they call it the simplified simplified approach. This is in this and, and, and we're all, and we're also going to limit ourselves here to bolted welded, such as the one shown over here. The reference for this will be the manual, page 10-78 through 81, and table 10-8 is very, very helpful for these. There are lots of other situations with, 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 with bracket plates, so for those, we would need to go look in, at other sources, like, for example, some textbooks like the Salmon, Johnson, and Malhaus here, or the journal paper by Sputo and Elifrit that we'll cite later on in the, in the session today. So we're limiting ourselves to, to connections like the one shown on the right. First, how do we establish the seat stiffener thickness so that it's strong enough? We're trying to establish this thickness T. For the, in a simplified procedure, we simply go to the manual, page 10-80, and T must be at least the web thickness of the beam times the ratio of the yield stresses for the beam and the stiffener. That's the first requirement. You really can't get much easier than that. The second requirement is that the thickness must be at least two times the weld size, W, that's lowercase w, and that's if the stiffener is 36 KSI. Or if it's 50 KSI, then the thickness has to be at least 1.5 times W. Again, this is a simplified procedure that's in the manual. So that's pretty much it for establishing the thickness of the stiffener. Next, what about the seat width capital W? Note we've got a lowercase w weld in the capital for the width. That's going to be based on the, set, on the setback plus the required length, or re requ required bearing length. So first the setback is a half inch nominal plus a quarter inch for the beam length tolerance, so we got three quarters of an inch for that. And then we have this required L sub B for web local yielding and web local crippling. That's going to establish how big W needs to be. Note also we have this, this design A that's really, really nice near the end of, near the end of part nine, table 9-4, and here for web local yielding, for example, you, you, you can yank the VR, VR1 out of there, VR2 out of there, and just multiply it by LB to get the design strength. Or if you know R sub U, you can back out LB required from this. So these are really, really quick, especially helpful for web crippling, which is more difficult, obviously. What about the, the stiffener depth and the weld? We need to deal with this weld group. So, so we have a T-shaped weld group like shown. The length is obviously L, and the horizontal length is 0.2L on both sides minimum. It can, can be larger, obviously. With this, we're also going to use the elastic method, and it's facilitated big time by table 10-8 in the manual. We'll look at that in a second, but first I want to point out one, one thing here. What do you use for the weld between the stiffener and the seat? Well, what you do there is it's got to be the same size W as you use here. And this is so that you can incorporate this horizontal weld up here to work with the vertical weld there. Right now let's take a look at table 10-8 and you can see how well this works. We get capital W there. That's the width of the seat. We have lowercase w. That is the weld size. And you can see that that, that goes across here, quarter inch, 5 sixteenths, and so on. The length, L, is this vertical length there. So this is as simple as you go in here, 
and you find the right L and you go grab the strength out of here for, for the right weld size, seat, and the weld length. You grab the strength right out of there, no problem. What do we do with the column web base metal? Of course, in general, we any, anytime we have a weld, the base metal of each connected part applies. We need to, we need to be checking both. So what do we do here? So the column base column web base metal is a little bit little bit different. So let's let's bring it out and talk about it explicitly. We're going to use the T min approach. It's in the manual equation 9-2, right at the front of part nine. And what this is is the T min is the the minimum thickness of the plate such that you're guaranteeing the weld controls instead. That so this plate's not controlling. That that's what T min is, and it's derived right near equation 9-2 in the manual, so you can see that if you, and then study it if you haven't seen it already. So here here's what we do. If you only have the stiffener on one side of the column web, then the minimum thickness of the column web is 3.09 times D. Which is, the number, which is the number of sixteenths of an inch in W, and divided by F sub U of the column. And if the column web is thicker than that, then you're guaranteed that the column web doesn't control. What if you have a stiffener on both sides? You have, you have one of these C to connections on the near side and the far side. Well, you can calculate T min on each side and add them, and, that, and that's going to be the T min for the column. What if the column web thickness does not exceed, or is, is, is lower, or is smaller than T min? In that case, thing, the, the, the thing to do there is to take the strength of the weld that we just determined a minute ago, and just ratio by the the provided web thickness divided by the T min. This is a pretty pretty easy approach. What about column web punching shear? The idea here is that if the column web is flexible, it could bend some, and you and you have the stiff seat. The seat plate is stiff in plane, so you have this flexible out of plane column web. You may have stress concentrations in this region that might cause weld distress or maybe even fracture. So we want to avoid that. Next, also, if it's very flexible, you may bend the thing so much that the flanges are, are rotating some. And that could even decrease the column strength. So we don't want to have either one of these things happen. So the solution, a couple of solutions. One is we can have a stiff enough column web. The second is we can put a stiffener back here on, on the back side. But we're not going to, probably not going to have to do that because in the manual, page 10-79, they provide a simplified approach. And it applies to these columns, W8 by 24 and heavier, 10 by 33 and heavier, and these two and heavier. Now, note these are about the littlest column you would ever use anyway in these depths. So this is not going to be an issue, most likely. A couple more details with the simplified approach. Is there's a few prescriptive requirements here. First, they actually call out that the top angle needs to be at least a quarter of an inch. That's true in, gener in general, by the way, for all the stiffened seated connection material that we're showing here. Also, the beam is not, should not be welded to the seat plate. It needs to be bolted, like shown there. It needs to have high strength bolts, and this B dimension needs to not exceed the max of W over 2 or 2 and 5 eighths of an inch. Also, there's more prescriptive more prescriptive language in this simple type procedure. When you have this W is eight or nine inches, and you have this B, which is between three and a half inches or W over two, then it's a little different, and you need to go get this this journal paper and check it out. Also, there's slightly different rules for W14 by 43. These dimensions change a little bit, so there's some stuff there too. So these are kind of odd odd cases, but note that they exist and be be aware of them. So that's our simplified approach for making sure that the column is okay. With that, that's it. That's, that's the end of our series, and I thank you all very, very much for attending, and I really hope you got a lot out of this and find the material useful. So with that, uh, back to you, Nate. All right. Well, thank you very much, Brad.
so we're going to go to our, our question time uh, like we have in the other sessions. Uh, but also like the other sessions, we'll start that off with a couple of questions to test the audience. And we'll be doing that with our, our uh, webinar polling module here. So the first of those two questions is a true or false statement. And that statement is as follows, true or false. The factor for block shear, UBS, is taken as 0 0.5 for extended single plate shear connections with two columns of bolts. Is that a true or false statement? The factor for block shear, UBS, is taken as 0 0.5 for extended single plate shear connections with two columns of bolts. Okay, it looks like the answers have mostly come in now. Let's go ahead and look at the results of this. All right, Brad, so 86% of the respondents think that that is a true statement. Did they get one, that one right? Brad, are you with us? Oops, sorry, I muted myself. Oh, uh, yes, that that in, that is correct. So, so the the uh, 100 people who answered true, they got it right. And the way I work this out is looking at the commentary for section J4. There's a whole picture, or a whole page full of pictures of different cases with different U factors or UBS. And there's one at the bottom. It only shows one. Uh, that has a has, has, has a picture of a single coped beam, top coped beam, where block shear is being checked, and it's got two columns of bolts. And in that case, they're recommending to use UBS equal to 0.5. And I look at that, and then I look at this this um, single plate shear connection with two columns of bolts. I think it's similar to that. So in my judgment, we're using 0 0.5 for UBS there. All right. Good job, everyone. Let's try another. Second polling question is as follows. When should one consider the effect of eccentricity on the angle leg attached to the supporting member in single angle connections? That A, when the angle is welded to the support, B, when that outstanding leg is bolted to the support with one column of bolts, C, two columns of bolts to the support, D, all of the above, or is it E, none of the above? The question is again, when should one consider the effect of eccentricity on the angle leg attached to the supporting member in single angle connections? Give this a little bit more time for folks to think this one over. All right. I think most of the results have come in, so let's go ahead and see what the audience thought. Uh, the final tally has 60% of respondents saying that the answer is D, all of the above, and we did have about 25% say that the answer is C. So what's the correct answer we're looking for here, Brad? Okay, D is correct. Uh, this question is is regarding the outstanding leg of the of the connection, the one that's connected to the the girder or the column. And in, in, in that case, we, we always consider the, consider the eccentricity. We have one eccentricity for the angle and one eccentricity for the bolts. They could be different. Or, and then, of course, we have the eccentricity for the welds for the welded case. And so we always consider those. Um, the, the, the two bolts, uh, like in, um, in part C there, That'd be regarding the uh, the other leg, the leg that that could be bolted to the beam, the the supported beam. In that case, if we have two columns of bolts, then we would consider the eccentricity there. 
But no, for the outstanding leg, we're always consider, considering the eccentricity because think about it, the, 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 um, there's nothing stopping, there, 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 there's nothing but the angle and the bolt stopping the end of the beam from twisting. So we, we have to consider the eccentricity there. All right. Good job, everyone. So let's go ahead and move into some of these questions that we have been fielding from the audience, starting on slide 17. So the question is, in bolted-bolted connections, bolted-bolted single-angle connections, why is the bolt eccentricity ignored? Are you, is there an explanation on, on that? So can, can, I'm sorry, can you re repeat that? Yeah, in bolted, bolted, single angle connections, why is the bolt eccentricity ignored? I'm assuming you're talking about on the, on, on the, on, on, on the beam side. It's just, yes. it's mainly by, it's mainly by convention. It's just the way it's been done. Uh, it's always been done that way for double angle connections. If we only have one column of bolts and the eccentricity is small, then it, it can be done, and then it's all okay. It just it, it it just works out. I would say mainly by by convention or tradition. All right. Moving forward a couple of slides to slide 19. Uh, are you able to perhaps with your pointer arrow clarify where the location of the failure plane and the angle is? resulting from flexural rupture. Flexural rupture, what if I can draw on this thing? I think I can, like here. What kind of wiped it out, didn't it? Maybe I should erase that. Sorry. Maybe a, di maybe a different color. Yeah, or I don't know if I can make it thinner. Uh, nah, it's okay. I'll just point at it. Okay, okay so um, in for flexural rupture, let's, let's on the right, that's, that's more difficult, I guess. In, 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 in this case, think about the bending moment in this angle. The bending moment starts at zero over here, it increases linearly till you get to here, and, 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 and it comes back down linearly until you get over here somewhere. So the maximum bending moment is right here on this line. That's also where these holes are. So we have stress concentrations up here, we have ten tension up here, uh, in you know, horizon a horizontal tension stress up there, and so we have we would have rupture starting up here somewhere in flexure, and the, of course the moment would be v sub u times e sub a, so it'd be right about here is where it would start in that region, so that's why we check it at that first bolt line. All right. Let's move forward a little bit. I'm going to settle on slide 35, and this question was asked about single plate shear connections. The question asker states, I've never understood why bolts need to be checked for the eccentric shear when the location of the pin is the bolts due to plowing. If that is where the connection rotates, then why is there a moment to be checked at that location? Yeah, that that and it 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 brings about something that's that's it's different for these kinds of connections than all of our other kinds of connections. Remember way a long time ago, I guess last session, first of last session, I said that the the hinge is at the most flexible part of the connection. That's true for those other kinds of connections like the end plates and angles and all those where it's flexing at the at the face of the support. Here it's different. Um, here we're taking a, a different approach. The the most flexible part would be at, at the bolt line, but we're, that's not where we're taking the hinge in this case. Uh, we, we know from the test results that have, been, that, that have been gathered over the last 20 or 30 years that there is some eccentricity on the bolts. And so we, we, even though we're using them as the means of flexibility or, duct, or ductility, as, as far as the using that, that location for the means of ductility with the plowing in the plate, even so, we do consider the eccentricity in the bolts. And I'll note one thing here, the eccentricity is very small. It really didn't make much difference 
in the calculations for the concentric or for the for the conventional single plate connection. We 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 checked it uh, concentric for the to get the trial section, and it really wasn't all that much different for the ex eccentric uh, bolt shear strength. So if that's any comfort at all, I don't know. Maybe it is. Hopefully. All right. Let's move forward. A couple of questions on extended single plate shear connections and their effect, what uh, level of effect they have on the column as a supporting member. Um, and so the first question was, let's see here. The single plate shear connection will add extra moment on the column. So I guess that's a question. Will the single plate shear connection add extra moment on the column um, because of any eccentricity, uh, eccentric shear effects on the on the weld to the column? Well, our design model would would say no. We we're putting the hinge up against the face of the column, and and that's just the way we do it for the, in, in, in this design model. Could it add some eccentricity there? Could it add some moment there? It certainly seems a lot like it probably could, but that's, that's just not the, not the design model that, that we use. Now, I know for, for the, we, we, we don't have any ex ex explicit check of this web when it's a column web, but if we had a, except for the base metal, if we had a, an HSS wall that we are connecting to, then we we do have some have a limit and have something to say about that in the, near the end of part ten of the manual. As far as the member design goes, no, we just put the hinge right there at the end of the at the end of the plate. All right, and uh, I guess the next question you're starting to answer that the next question um, that was about this, and that that question was. When connecting to the web of the column, should we not be concerned about fracture or shear punch of the web column um, that we saw later on with the stiffened uh, seated connection? So can you just clarify what the, the thought is there? Well, we should be, we, we do need to check the base, base metal strength of the column web. We do, do need to check that, and I probably should have shown that in this example, but I, I cut the end of the example off at the, um, at the edge of the plate. Okay, so I probably should have done that. As far as the uh, as bending of the of the web, I don't think we have to do that. I need to go study more and read more in the um, in the uh, part ten of the manual to see if there's any new language for that. I don't think there is. I I, I think we don't we don't check the plate uh, for that now, or check check the uh, the web for that now. I do know for for sure, though, if we have an NHSS wall that we are connecting this to, then we do need to take a look at that. And there's a requirement. I think it's from memory. I think it says if you just can't have, cannot have a slender HSS. All right. So next question is on this welded unstiffened seated connection on slide 66 here. So the question is, is the K design that you're talking about here, the, is that the K dimension for the angle or the beam? And why is there this requirement that the, the LB be greater than K designed? OK, so the, uh, the, uh, the LB, wait. I'm, well, let, let me answer the second question first. I was a little, 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 little confused by the first question. Okay, the second question, that's just what the spec says to do. It says you can't have the, the bearing length less than or equal to K. And if you think about it, K is pretty small. And you, you wouldn't want to have a knife edge there, obviously. So they, they just have that requirement in section J10.2. Now, what was the first question again? Yeah, so the question is, is this K dimension that you're talking about, K design, are you talking about the K of the beam or the K of the angle seat in this situation? The beam. The, the, the beam. It's the K of the beam. All right. Now, also, uh, by the way, backing up um, to, to two questions ago, 
about the uh, the uh, the uh, the moment on the column. If you look on page 10-90 below below note number six, uh, it says, and I, I knew it said this. I just want to be sure. It says uh, the design procedure for extended single plate shear connections permits the column to be designed for an axial force without eccentricity. In some cases, the economy may be gained by considering alternative design procedures that transfer some of the moment into the column. So in, typically, we're, we're just going to put that hinge over there, like, like I said, and, and not, not consider any moment there. But you could. And, and note also, but part 10 of the manual is not code required. This is, these are design procedures. You can do something else if it's advantageous. Or, or if, if your judgment is that you shouldn't do what's in part 10, do something else. It's, it's your engineering judgment. All right. So one last question here. Um, we're just going to stick with this uh, CETA connection portion. And the question here was seeking a clarification of the eccentricity being shown here on this slide. Is this E going to the edge of the fillet of the – so the question is, E goes to the edge of the fillet. Is are you talking about the toe of a fillet weld, or what are you referring to when you mention fillet on this on this uh, slide? Okay. Well, we have these hot rolled angles, and so we have this this lowercase k dimension of the angles that actually that that's actually tabulated. But we we but so that's that's the fillet. But we we're just using three eighths three eighths for that. Um, just it's just the curved part of the inside of the angle there. That's what we're trying to say. You have this, the angle angle is thicker there, thicker there at the intersection of the vertical and horizontal legs. And of course, it, as, 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 as that radius comes down and, and meets the, the uh, lower part of the horizontal leg, that's the thinnest, that's the first spot that, that you have this thinnest part. That, that, that's, that's only T sub A thick. So we're, we're checking at the edge of the fillet in the angle. If you, if you go to table, was it one dash seven? I think, or what is it? It's one table one dash seven. You can see the um, the K dimensions on there for the for this fillet. Now we we, we don't use the K, K dimension. We're using this T sub A plus three eighths in this design model, just to make it quicker and simpler. All right. Well. I think we are pretty much out of time for questions here, so Brad, thank you for taking the time to provide those answers. And uh, we did have quite a few other questions that we didn't have time to get to, uh, so just want to let people know out there that we will work with Brad to answer those questions that we did not get to um, via email. So uh, thank you for submitting those questions. And that does it for this webinar and this webinar series. As always, we encourage you to take some time to fill out the survey form that will display on your screen at the conclusion of this session. Thank you for, to Brad Davis for presenting the webinar series, and thank you all for participating. We look forward to seeing you all at another AISC Live webinar very soon.